information we've heard today about that school shooting that occurred. You know, I, I, I just wonder what it would look like if a little Bible teacher could walk into a school and say, love the enemy. Could say, these are the Ten Commandments that God has said that you are to live by. This is Jesus Christ. He paid the price for your sins. What kind of world would it be if we could walk into a school system like that? Some of y'all probably grew up in a school system like that. And yet, as we sit here tonight, we live in a country that pushes God away from the children as much as possible. And we are only allowed to come on the outskirts and draw them in here to this church so we can tell them the truth. This is the world we live in today. And I just think, you know, people say uh, there's no such thing. I don't ever see demon possession. Folks, you've seen demon possession today. If, a, if somebody can pick up a gun, walk into a school, and start shooting people, I promise you the devil was there. There's no doubt in my mind the devil was there. The devil comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He'd like to steal, kill, and destroy every one of you as well. Thank God we have the weapons of our warfare, the truth of the Word of God. But I want to talk to you about something so foreign to this world that, that they can't even comprehend what I'm going to talk about tonight. They can't even grasp it. They talk about love, but that's not what, you know, on your television stuff, today's Valentine's Day, and love, and all these different things. Well, a lot of that's lust, is what they were. <laughs> it didn't love. It didn't love. It isn't the love that our Savior has for us. So if you'll turn over in your Bibles to Matthew 5, I want to start at verse 43. And the Holy Word says, from our Lord Jesus, if preaching the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You may be seated. Now that first thing there, Jesus said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Uh, you know I like I like to go to the movies. I, I do, I do. I like to see the movies. I went to self see the new Star Wars movie. And you wouldn't believe how many people get tore up over these Star Wars movies. They do. I mean, I watched for months when that first one came out. They made all these different videos about how this story was going to go. This was going to head this way. And this was going to head this way. This was going to happen. And then when they went to the movie theater, everything was the complete opposite of everything they thought it was going to be. It was the complete opposite. It, nothing of it was the same. And all throughout it was like a joke. They had the main character going along. He says, everything you just said was wrong. Like he was mocking all those people who were the fans, you know, watching this. Well, Jesus is here saying, and he's saying everything you thought about the Old Testament, it was wrong. You've heard that it had been said. You heard it was this way. You thought it was this way that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. There's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. The Pharisees were teaching the people and they were claiming these different directions, this different idea, but there was more to it than that what they were saying. Now, now, where in the Bible does it say, Thou shalt love thy neighbor? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's Leviticus 19, verse 18. In Leviticus 19, 18, it says, Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. See, you thought Jesus was the only one who said that. Way back there, Moses penned that, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as, as thyself. Where does it say to hate thine enemy? Does it say in the Bible to hate your enemy? Have you ever heard of the imprecatory psalms? Imprecatory, that's a big word, imprecatory. An imprecatory psalm are those that invoke judgment, calamity or curses upon one's enemies or those perceived as the enemies of God. It's to call down God, just take care of them. 
Sometimes, do you not just get angry at some things and just say, God, just take care of it. Just take care of the evil in the world. Take care of it. Then I forget I might be a little bit of that evil too and i got to step back a notch, right? But we should want evil to be stopped within the world. We should want that to occur. Psalm 137, this is probably the most harshest of the imprecatory psalms. It was pinned down and they were writing down about how Babylon come in and when the Babylonians come in, they carried off the children of Israel into captivity. They would take their babies, pull them from their mama's hands and throw them down on the rocks and bust their heads. Well, the Israelites, they got mad. They were angry. And when they went out in Psalm 137, verse 8 through 9, it says, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. You can hear the anger in their voice. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. I want revenge on those people for what they've done to my people, God. That's a harsh statement, isn't it? That's a harsh statement. But that was a psalm that they pinned down uh, showing how they wanted judgment to come on those who had done such evil. And you know, it's okay to hurt when somebody hurts you. It's okay to feel that inside. It's okay to own that. To know that, that you've been hurt. That someone has done you wrong. Another imprecatory psalmist in Psalm 139. Surely it says, Thou wilt slay the wicked, O God. To part from me, therefore, ye bloody men. For they speak against thee wickedly. And thine enemies take thy name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred, he says. I could, I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. God, look inside of me. I'm angry when I see evil in the world. And you should be angry when you see evil in the world. Now all those represent emotions that, that we should have towards evil when it's done. Which should make us angry. There should be a righteous anger rise up inside of us. But the Old Testament was given to a nation that was to have punishment for crimes. We have punishment for crimes, right? Actually, in reality, I don't think the punishments for some of our crimes are as bad as they should be. Some people get, uh, I mean, horribly murdered and mutilated and they'll sit their entire life. How long did Charles Manson sit his entire life after he worked it out to go have that woman and her baby murdered within the womb, killed, had them women go down there and kill those people in that Helter Skelter event. He sat there the rest of his life and they fed him. They took care of him. He became an idol to the people, didn't he? No, he should have been killed then, shouldn't he? Capital punishment did not begin at the Ten Commandments. Did you know that? Capital punishment began with Noah way back there. God said there's a government and He carries the sword and He does not carry it in vain. We continue that today in Romans 13. So when, when these things we're talking about, it's talking about a nation going in and stopping the evil. And that's what the nation should do. The New Testament is in the age of grace. It is. And, and there's still this case in the form of governments. But as an individual, is it your right to go stop somebody else to to go in like a vigilante and, and just kill people because you think this or that? Or is it the government's right? It's the government's right, right? It's the government's right. And this is where the Jews were getting it wrong. They were to share the gospel, the truth of, of, of God with the rest of their neighbors. But you know what they did? They began to look at those who were mean to them and to hate them. Not to think that, you know, the Babylonians, they had done this thing, horrible thing to them. But they didn't imagine that they could go in there and tell them about their God. Now Daniel did, didn't he? Daniel told about his God. You'll find Nebuchadnezzar at one point in time. It almost looks like he converts. It does. I'm not sure if it went way there. But it looks like he converts to his God. So there were Jews who did it right. But in this age, they were saying, you know, the Jews, they look down on everybody else. All the Gentiles will have nothing to do with them. So when Jesus is saying this here, He's saying, you've heard it's been said this way, thou, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. You should hate evil in the world, but you let the government take care of it. The government's not been given the sword in vain, Romans 13. And we're not just a nation on earth, but we're the kingdom of heaven. And this is what Jesus showed us. You should have anger in your heart for evil when it's done. But Jesus says here, but I say unto you, love your enemies. Love them. 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Wow. 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 The fact that love is a command shows you that you don't necessarily have to feel that right away, right? It's something that God that He is telling you. It's not just of your emotions. It's not the same as your natural affection of love, but it is a decision that you make. It's a decision that you make based on that supernatural grace inside of you that He's given you. He's made you a new creature in Christ, right? Amen? He's made you different than the rest of the world. And He says you have the ability to make the choice to love somebody who is your enemy. Someone who is actually your enemy. You have that choice inside of you because He has shown that agape, that unconditional love to you. Now you can show it to others. And then He tells you to go the next step. He says to bless them. Well, how can you bless your enemy? How would you bless your enemy? The only way to bless your enemy is to tell them the truth. To give them the gospel. To show them the truth that there is a that there's only one way to heaven. Now, most enemies ain't going to like that, right? They ain't going to like the truth. They're not going to like you loving them. They're not going to like you showing them any care. And there's a point when you can't give them a blessing. You just got to step back and say, that's as far as I can go. In uh, Matthew 7, he talks about judge not. You remember that? And that's probably the most favorite verse of most people in the modern age, judge not. But that whole idea isn't about, uh, it's about having a judgmental way about you. But the idea is, you get the little piece of sin out of your life, out of your eye, so you can go over and pull the big... Uh, the log out of their eye, right? You get all, you get the sinful condition of yourself aside. So you can help one another. But once you're able to help one another, you're able to show one another what God wants, He says there's some people that will never come to that point. In Matthew 7 verse 6, He says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. There are people it will be your enemy that no matter how much love you show them, you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful. You can show them love. You can care for them. You can show them the gospel. There comes a point in time you're not going to be able to show them the gospel. They're not going to accept it. They'll turn around and kill you. If I go over to an Islam, the Islamic State right now, and I say I'm a missionary in the Islamic State, I might just be signing my death warranty. You know? If I was to walk over there right now and begin preaching to them the, the gospel, uh, that, that'd be like casting your pearls before swine. I mean, I'd have to be real sure God told me to go in there and do that, right? I'd have to be real sure that I wouldn't be casting my pearls before swine with a big giant, and we're not talking about little baby pigs, we're talking about big hogs come and tear you up, rip you to pieces. But once you go that step that you're willing to bless them by sharing them the gospel, there's another step. You actually do good to them. Really do good to them. You know, I've heard people say that the Sermon on the Mount, it's of a different dispensation. It's looking ahead to the Millennial Kingdom that this isn't something you can possibly do on your own. You can't really love your enemies, they say. They say you can't do that. Well, I ask you, what about Romans 12? Romans 12, 19, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Your enemy. If he thirst, give him drink. In so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. This is what a Christian is to be. When somebody's mean to you, you show them love in return. And it says it's like heaping great big coals on their head. The idea, there was a, uh, an idea that you would walk through uh, and you put these coals of fire on your head to show you were under conviction back then. You're under conviction. So when you go in and you show love to someone who's being mean to you, well, that tears them on to pieces. It, it, it causes them, why are they being nice to me? Why are they doing that? Why are they being nice to me? I never will forget uh, my mom and daddy that there was a problem at the church. There was a trial that was going on. And there were some people just so mad at them for something that had happened. 
And every time they would see these certain people out in town, they'd go by and they'd say, well, hi, how are you? <laughs> and you could see them people. They'd be like, you know, had their face all rounded up and they'd go, you know, they, they might wave back. Some of them didn't wave back at all. They just, you know. Then what Jesus wants us to do? Act like that with sour puss faces. I mean, really. Is that what Jesus wants us to do? But Jesus does want us to love our enemy. He wants us to, to go the extra mile to show them love. Because He loves them too and He wants them to be blessed by receiving that gospel. Most of the time when people act like that, they ain't received that gospel, I don't think. They ain't seen it quite right. It's also seen in Proverbs 25. It says, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Now we know where old Paul got that from, right? He was looking back to the Proverbs when he read that down. So does that sound like that's a future command or, or one for all time? No, it's one for all time. If you're a man of God, if you're a woman of God, you will have compassion in your heart for other people. Even when they're mean to you. Even when they're spiteful and they use you and they treat you wrong, you're going to show compassion in your heart. And then it goes as far to say to pray for them. Now, I've not met many people that you can begin praying for that it wasn't too much longer that you didn't feel as bad toward them. You know what I mean? I mean, if you really do pray for them and you begin to think about what I want to pray for them about, you know, you might start off the first time and say, Lord, I pray that you just get that man some brains. Wake him up, you know. Make him see the way it ought to be. And that might be your prayer. The next night you get a little convicted about that and say, well, that wasn't too loving. So you say, well, I pray that you take care of his kids at least. But still give him some brains. <laughs> then the next night you might pray a little different. I pray. I don't know what his life's been like. I wonder why he acts that way. I wonder why he does the things that he does. Lord, help him. And then a little later, you begin to pray and you think, huh, I wonder when he was a little kid, he had a mama, he had a daddy that cared for him, took good care of him, or tried to. Or maybe they wasn't a mom and daddy around at all. Maybe that's the problem. He was somebody's kid. Somebody loved him more than anybody else. You see? And then the next time you get to pray, you think, you know, I could have been in that situation. That could have been me that went that was like that. And you begin to take that person who was your thorn in your side, that person who was aggravating and you just wish they'd get rid of them, and they become a real person that you relate to as you begin to pray for them over and over again. I think there's good reason why Jesus said to pray for your enemies as well, right? I think there's a good reason. And why would that be? Why would Jesus even tell us to act like this? Why would He tell us to make a choice to love people who hate us? who treat us wrongly, who get on our nerves. Maybe for one, it makes us a little less selfish. And first of all, verse 45 there says, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For He maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Uh, this isn't what makes you a children of your father. This makes you look like a children of your father. Have you ever noticed? I noticed the other day Nolan put on those glasses and he looked just like David. <laughs> I thought on Facebook. He looked just like David. He looked like his daddy, right? You look like your father. You look like your mama. There's something about you. You say, oh no. Do you see what my mama and daddy look like? There's something about you took something from them. So when you show love to your enemy... You look like God. You actually get that name Christian. It's very clear that you're someone who loves your enemies. And how do I know that? Because 
God loved you and you were His enemy. Romans 5 verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, the not godly, the against God. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Saved from the wrath of the rightful wrath of the, towards the enemy. For it says here in verse 10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. You know, when you got up this morning, God gave you a valentine because He loved His enemies. He gave everybody on the planet, well, most of them, a valentine. First of all, they were able to wake up. He allowed it. He allowed you to wake up. He allowed you to be able to move your legs, to step out of the bed. Even those people who mocked him on television, even the wicked people who would go on and go shoot somebody in a high school uh, high school today, he allowed them to have oxygen. He allowed people who would go online and spit in his face and write blasphemies about him. He allowed them to breathe today. God did that. He doesn't only do it today. He does it day after day after day after day. All these people who hate Him with all their guts, He allows them to live one more day. One more day. He loves His enemy. Such that maketh His Son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. If you didn't get rain back during that time, your crops wouldn't grow and you'd die. But He sent rain to those who were bad and those who were good. He sent it to both. Both. He loves His enemies. And think about it. We have even more than that. We have home. We have family. We have food. And He gave His Son to die for us. His only Son. We can't have compassion on somebody that rubs us the wrong way, that says something about us. Well, I've held on to that grudge so long, Scott. I'll tell you what, and they deserve it. Well, maybe they do. But let God take care of them. You don't have to. Matter of fact, you probably wouldn't do near as good a job as He'd do at it, right? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Not me. I'm not my vengeance. Sometimes I feel sorry for people. I know they keep doing the wrong and they're, they're your enemy. And then God finally does judge them. And you think to yourself, Lord, please just give them another chance. But He knows best, doesn't He? He says here finally, the last few verses. For if, if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Isn't it kind of easy to do? Love them which love you. And do not even the publicans the same. That's not the republicans. Uh, that was the uh, tax collectors. The ones who uh, were considered to be the lowest of the low in that society. And, and if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? You only talk to the people down at sunrise? You don't talk to nobody else? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That, that Greek word there, perfect, is teleos. And it means complete. Complete. Completely. You want to be complete... Be ye therefore complete, even as your Father which is in heaven is complete. He is perfect. He is absolutely perfect, complete. And the idea here is, do you want to be a full Christian? Full. Full. Do you want to halfway look like your Father? Or do you want to partway look like your Father? There's a lot of Christians that are okay with just partway looking like their Father. 
They don't want to be looking just like their father. There's an idea, a variation of that word found in John 19, 28 and 30. And Jesus was on the cross. And as He was on the cross, this is what it says, that after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished. Well, that's that a variation of that word again, teleo. That the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to His mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. It is complete. It is perfect. It is, in the Latin, to telesti, Greek, to leo. It meant paid in full. Paid in full. It was an accounting term that showed that the debts was paid. So Jesus here is saying in this verse, this idea of absolute completeness, He's saying if you want to be a mature Christian, this is the big one. You know, you can do all these different things. You can do all these different things. You can read your Bible every day. You can say, I'm here at church every day. You can take a home ever award for attendance that you want. But if you love your enemy, oh my, you're full. You're, you're perfect. You are, you are doing what He has asked you to do. You are incomplete. You are immature. You are lacking in your Christian walk until you really do love your enemies. You make the choice to love your enemies. Like I said, there's some Christians that never grown up. 1 Corinthians 3, 2. Paul sends a letter to that group. Tells them, you know, I'd really like to feed you some meat. But all you do is drink milk like a baby. You ain't big enough. You don't love your enemies. Hebrews 5, 12 says similar things. Folks, you've got to make the decision to grow up. We do that. I mean, we grow up physically, don't we? But we've got to make the decision to love our enemies. The next time you feel in your heart that I've got to spout out something hateful to somebody, think back to yourself. And think about the debt that Jesus paid. It is full. It is finished. He paid the complete debt for you. Was that fair? Not a bit fair. He never did a thing wrong. He didn't deserve a cross. He didn't deserve any of those things. He did all that for you and it was the most unfair act that ever did occur on the face of the earth. But He did it for you. Now, when somebody does something mean to you and it ain't fair, what are you going to do back to them? He showed love, didn't he? He showed love. And that's what we should do as well. If you need to speak with someone about what was discussed in this sermon, you can find our phone number at our church's Facebook page. Or we would love for you to come meet us at one of our regular meetings in person. Sunrise is located directly off Exit 23 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. We regularly meet Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for small group Bible studies and then at 10.50 a.m. for worship. We also meet Sunday evenings for worship at 6.30 p.m and Wednesday nights for discipleship training at 6.30 p.m. We would love for your family to meet our family. And again, thank you for watching and sharing with others.